All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, I was just thinking about what does it mean to teach motor skills and fundamental clinical skills. Uh, and so I thought it would be great to take a look at some of the things that we've been doing, some of the things we've been thinking about, and really open this up as a conversation among us. Um, again, I'm recording this for others who aren't able to attend. And feel free, actually, at any point. I, I enjoy these deep dives because it gives us a chance to chat. It gives us a chance to discuss things that we are, we are all doing differently um, or perhaps the same. Um, and also, it gives me a chance to kind of go into each of the apps a little bit deeper to show you what's in there and maybe to just stimulate a conversation about potentially how we can use it. So um, just off the top, uh, I just want to let people know that, man, I've been in this game for a long time. Uh, I've been 17 years at Azusa Pacific University, um, um, a teaching and learning fellow here at the university, as well as my residency and fellowship training was done at Kaiser. Um, I still teach for Kaiser in the residency and fellowship, as well as the USC Spine Fellowship. Um, and then PhysioU has really been my passion project. Uh, and it's, it's so exciting actually to have more and more of you faculty joining us, um, building new apps. I will show you a number of different new apps um, that are coming down the pipe. And then at the university, I chair the institutional review board. So that keeps me busy as well. So I'm gonna let James actually go ahead and introduce himself briefly. Go ahead, James. And you'll have to- Hi, I'm, yep. I'm James Simjian. I, I was muted earlier, Michael, sorry. When you muted everybody, that included me. Um, yeah, I've been teach I taught for 26 years, uh, backed off from teaching about two and a half, three years ago, uh, doing uh, other things. Um, certified athletic trainer for 22 years, uh, help out I help out direct out the ATC and PTA content with PhysioU. Um, background is uh, past president of California Physical Therapy Association, and kind of in the uh, latter portion of my career here, I did more health policy and more um, political advocacy stuff. Kind of went to that. We're all good health scientists, but I don't think as physical therapists, we're very good political scientists and the political science to bring about um, health policies that are good for our clients and our patients, and we need to make sure that's happening. So that's what I've been doing the last portion of my academic and my professional career so perfect and that is it great thank you james and part of the reason why james is part of this conversation is because he was using our gate app in class and he was part of the part it, part of the conversation as we were developing it what were the challenges of teaching movement in the classroom um, what were the tools that we had and did they do the job uh, that we needed and so i think it will be nice to hear a little bit from james as well um, how you used it so so also, just to announce that PhysioU is now partnered with JOSPT. And so we are now providing videos and be a part of the guideline implementation strategy. Imagine all clinical practice guidelines, every revision, every technique and test, all of them will now have vis videos that you can play. And we hope that that will allow for guideline implementation in the classroom as well as worldwide so we can homogenize care. So this is an exciting and big deal for us. Um, and I think for JSPT as well, as we leverage the technology to implement research. Uh, this is always what we've tried to do in all of our apps. So I wanted to think about a few ways to talk about PhysioU apps in the online classroom. The first one I was gonna talk about because it kind of affects all of us in the same way, which is in the early, I mean, fall semester is coming, many programs are about to start. And we really have to think about how are we going to run labs and how are we going to teach fundamental clinical skills? And are we prepared to provide students with the best resources to learn these skills? And so as simple as it may be, so I'm going to take you for a second into, uh, into the app here. So PhysioU, for those of you who have, who have not played with it, I think the, most, the bulk of you have, PhysioU is a collection of apps that we've built to augment your classroom to make your life easier so that all the techniques you need to demonstrate, they can watch ahead of time. They can watch after class. They can watch with you online while you give them extra tips and tricks. So a lot of the heavy lifting of the techniques and showing the techniques can already be done for you. So when you log in, most of you already have your login. When you log in at physiou.com, you get to sign in. And when you sign in, you end up here. 
Now, just as a reminder, all of these apps can float just on your phone like a little icon, like an app icon. But the reason why this is completely web-based is because there are so many videos that it would completely clog your entire device. And so it also allows us to update and provide new apps in a much easier way. So here's the Range of Motion MMT app. So Dan Farwell and I, Dan Farwell is my wingman in ortho and he used to teach at USC. We said, you know what, I think we can teach range of motion better, range of motion MMT. And my colleague, Eric Fulmar out of Northeastern, he said, hey, by the way, could you add in a palpation component? Because a lot of our early classes have a palpation component. And so here you will see that we have organized palpation, right? Because our class starts, our class starts in January and it's tied to a gross anatomy. So they learn about the structures in gross anatomy and then they go to class and they do bony landmark and soft tissue landmark palpation. The cool thing about this is that you can make this an active learning experience. Before shoulder week, the students will come in and they will already have a list of palpations that they're supposed to try on each other or try on themselves or someone that they're living with. And they can go through that palpation experience as an active part of their learning. So you can see that there is images that trigger the connection to the anatomy. And there's we're also- palpating the intertubercular groove. We're going to identify our tubercle, greater tubercle of the humerus moving just anterior in this position. And you will feel that little groove right into that position here. So you have all of these different uh, different structures for the students to palpate and that includes of course your soft tissue common structures so you can see anterior structures the deltoids the patient position your resistance the cues and we purposely added little anatomy tables so that it would build a bridge between the content so what they learn in anatomy they're going to reflect on the action of those muscles where it or originates and inserts and the innervation. So a lot of this bridge building, I think, creates an environment where learning is deeper. So they don't close a chapter like, I'm done with anatomy now, I've got to work on my clinical skills range of motion class. They're directly connected all the time. And so again, I think it's a new way of learning. It's a new way of thinking. We, we know we don't want our students to shelve the information when they move on to the next course. So this is our attempt for that. So this is palpation. So let me take you back into, let's take for example, head and neck. Let's look at range of motion. So when you look at the range of motion, we purposely added in a bunch of muscles. This was an update. We said anytime we talk about flexion, we really want the, the students to think about the muscles that are involved. So you'll see that same thing for wrist and hand. Let's look at range of motion. And you can see here all, oh, I'm surprised actually, that part must not have gotten updated yet because we've been working on that. So let me show you back to shoulder, manual muscle test. Here are all your muscles. I think wrist and hand, if you look at the manual muscle test, here are all your common muscles. So when you go into that, Usually what we did in our last class, so we just finished our manual muscle test range of motion class, you will see that the students watch the video ahead of time. They learn about the cues and the stabilization, the grading, and then eventually the key muscles. There's always a little bit of the keys to reliability. So this is Dan basically saying, hey, so in the clinic where things are not optimal, here are some thoughts of things you might wanna consider. So grades zero through two and grades zero, three through five. So a common question that, um, that uh, faculty tend to ask is, hey, what resource did you base this on? Well, we based it first on the textbook that we were using, which is Berryman Reese. So the very similar, uh, Nancy Berryman Reese, the very similar style, we just filmed all the videos that matches. 
the other faculty who have said, hey, by the way, we're using different textbooks that have slightly different uh, positioning. So a very common one is, for example, HIP. So what we've started to do is we've started to film alternate, alternate positions. So as you are beginning to use the app and you begin to see some variation from how you teach it, please feel free to reach out to us. We will film the alternatives, even though I think the alternatives also is a big headache causer for us as faculty. So Dan and I sat down and said, what is the most logical and reasonable way to do these techniques? So Dan and Chris Patterson, the other professor who runs the class, and we came, we basically decided what we had was pretty darn reasonable and all the variations just creates confusion. Grant, uh, ultimately though, we've decided that as faculty write in, if we look at the alternatives that they ask for, if we think that is a good alternative to have, we go ahead and film it and then we just populate it. So one of the values of PhysioU and its content is that you always will have the latest edition. It is completely flexible. And yet, I would say that the, the education team thinks very carefully about how much stuff to add in there. Because I truly believe 17 years later that volume is the enemy of learning. Too much content means they can master none of it. If they come across seven, if every time they come into the, a fork in the road and there are seven possible choices, it makes it very difficult for them to learn the basic pathway of how to treat how to evaluate. So it's something for each of us to consider, and I'm hoping that PhysioU will be able to play a role in helping homogenize the content that we teach with. So, uh, yes. James, a couple comments real quick. One, just as a long-term user of this, um, I've always, yeah, students will come by and go, well, I looked up this text, or I've seen this on the internet to do it this way, and I go, fine, that's like a, you know, Toyota versus Chevy versus a Ford, and the cruise control, the emergency brake, the high beams might be somewhere else on the car, but you still know how to drive a car. And that's what we do at the beginning here. Um, you know, the other thing is like, um, what's on the state board exam? I mean, that's obviously what students ultimately have to pass to become practitioners. And also I tell them, you know, when you go to a clinic, your clinical instructor may have a different kind of way to do it and just accept it and learn from it and go from there. So it's your ability to process information. Uh, there's a specific question and that is what references or what reference do you primarily use when you are doing, um, when you're putting um, the material together for the PhysioU apps? So for many of these uh, more, I would say, kind of the fundamental clinical skills apps, we've primarily tried to augment our classroom based on the textbooks that we've been using, okay? So we just said, hey, you know what? Instead of having the students read about range of motion MMT, let's have them watch range of motion MMT, and then it translates so much better into the clinical skills. So the reference is primarily the textbooks that whatever program is using. When it comes to things like GATE, for example, so I'll show you the GATE app, we, prim we gathered a lot of that data in our motion lab, but we knew that we need to, to cross-reference the gold standard, which would be the Perry or the Rancho, all of that language and those numbers, we benchmarked to those numbers so that there would be standardization across the board. I remember, James, when we were talking about GATE, how important it was for us to be able to match, at least in the spirit of the language, how you were teaching it out of your textbooks. And so we made a strong effort to do that. So, so and then in, in the bulk of uh, uh, our other clinical apps, like our orthopedic apps, we are constantly scouring the literature. Um, Manny Young out of Connecticut, as part of his role is to always see what is the latest out there that we have to decide, do we need to get rid of old tests, add new tests, remove techniques that are no longer relevant. And then, so those apps are referenced to actual articles. In fact, right now we're going through an entire refresh of all the prevalence data. So the team is going through and looking for prevalence data for every single common condition, and we're refreshing the entire app. So I would say that it is a monster of a project, but I believe that today's clinician and today's education demands that type of resource. Uh, I, think, I think, Dr. Wong, um, 
uh, the clinical practice guidelines, uh, the evidence based behind stuff. I mean, right. If you look at if you look at McGee, I mean, there's every you know knee test you can think of in the sun there, and it'd be overwhelming. It's a you know just um, the, what do you say? Volume is the enemy of the, learning. Uh, enemy of learning. So, so I think as a, as instructors, you have the privilege and you have the responsibility to to context this with your students and say, hey, here's what this does. It's not the only way. It's a way. It's the way that that is shown uh, with evidence and such. But are other people doing it other ways out there? Sure, for your CIs and for um, other practices. So um, I think you couch it that way, uh, you, you're, you'll be okay uh, in terms of uh, telling students what to learn. But basically teach them how to drive a car, whether it's a Toyota, Chevy, or Ford. There's gonna be some variations a little bit in it, and, you just, and that's just part of getting your driver's license and getting your physical therapy license the same way. Right, and so what I just showed you here was that you know our apps every single clinical practice guideline that exists except for some of the more recent ones that we're working on they exist within the app they are referenced within the app there is links to these references direct links to the references and so we see ourselves as a potential tool to implement research in a, into the into the into the classroom and into worldwide practice Okay, so let me move back here. So that gives you a little glimpse. Uh, actually, the other thing I want to show you in the Range of Motion MMT app, so here's the Range of Motion MMT app, is that as part of this app, we have palpation, range of motion, manual muscle tests, as well as the neuro screen. So we teach this at in the early phase, and then they learn more and more about how to do it and how to use it appropriately as they come into orthopedics but here is your basic upper quarter dermatomes upper quarter myotomes and reflexes so what that means is that many of the skills that you need to show that we used to show in lab like the headache of thinking about lab i mean our faculty meeting last week was all about Guys, do you want to run five synchronous labs in five different rooms with 12 different 12 students in each room? Or do you want to run lab five times over the span of 10 hours? So in my mind, there's, it's a no-brainer uh, that we want to run our labs synchronously, one professor in each room, and we have our social dis distancing. I mean, there's a lot of things we really need to consider. And for now, I think it's inevitable that we have to consider that we need to show techniques and teach techniques online and we need to have a good way to do it and so I hope that physio U, the physio U videos will be useful to you so you don't you always know that you can refer to this um, and that we are always updating it based on your feedback all right so I'm going to move on so that's the range of motion MMT app so based on that conversation what I want to show you was that you can augment your lab handouts. I think the power of the videos is that now you can take the videos and put it into your lab handout the way you want it. So you can see here that this is my shoulder range of motion. I need to look at a bit, look for a video for shoulder passive range of motion. So what we've done for you is we've created a Physio U Master Video Cheat Sheet. Now, some of you may have heard it before, some of you are already using it, but on our website, under Educator, there is a free resources. So if I show that to you here, I think this is worth showing you separately. So if I go to PhysioU, and I go over to Educator, free resources, you will see that we've made it a little bit easier to find now. Here's your master videos cheat sheet. So if you have upcoming in the fall, a shoulder lab, the first week you're gonna do shoulder lab. So you come here and you switch to the range of motion manual muscle test app. And now you can say, hey, I need to go to shoulder. And here are all of my shoulder palpation videos. Here are all my shoulder range of motion videos, end feel, flexion, extension, abduction. Here are all my manual muscle test videos. So really all you have to do is copy and paste these links 
directly into your handout and your students will be able to when they click on this link it will take them directly into the PhysioU video and they can now watch practice try and review automatically done for you right so that includes all the gait videos all the phases all the muscle activity all the critical events all of these different pieces of content that I'll show you now can be embedded into your lectures and labs you can see all the faculty here working on that now and so this becomes a very centralized way for you to augment and enhance your content the students of course will need to be logged in I mean the only way that we can pay programmers patients and and do all of this work is to have some type of revenue that is helping us continue to grow this and you'll see with all of the new apps that are coming that we have the potential really to impact education in a very significant way this is what I think makes me most excited about what we're doing so you can see here that this physio you master cheat sheet you can access it here right you can access it here under educator free resources okay so this is always available for you to utilize Dr. Wong um, again tell them where the uh, educator tab is yeah so if you go to physiou.com so if you go to physiou.com and you look under educator right here and you'll see free resources down here and then under faculty resources you'll see the different webinars that we're running and then you'll also see the master video cheat sheet Okay. Afterwards, I'm going to show you teaching content, some of the stuff that you can utilize to make your life a little easier. And then here's our deep dive webinar series. And so we've done now an acute care, uh, acute care cardiopulmonary series, an ortho series, as well as a neuropediatric series. These are ones that you can actually direct your, your faculty to um, if they haven't seen it. And we're running this once a month, each one, once a week, right? Neuro one week, cardiopulm another week. Because I think beyond just seeing what we have, it really helps to hear how to use it. So that's why we are spending all this time to try to help you figure out how to best utilize this. That's the recorded uh, seminars? Yeah, those are the recorded seminars. No, how do they access it though? Oh, they can just click on the links. So they're, the oh, links okay. are here. So you can say, oh, I want to look at cardiopulmonary acute care. Here's the presentation deck. So that's a PDF. And here's the video that you can watch. Okay. And then, of course, you can actually jump around to the different time points as well, depending on your, your availability, uh, the amount of time you have. So, James, could you go ahead and um, mute yourself until, for just to minimize the little, little sounds coming in and out? All right, so here we are talking about graded exposure for motor skill training. So see, another, another thing that I've been thinking about, and we started using because we just finished our clinical skills class, uh, our range of motion MMT class. Actually, sorry, let me try to mute everybody one more time. Okay, there we go. And I'm gonna share screen. All right, so here is the graded exposure for motor skill training. What we've done, now that you have a lab handout that has all of the techniques and videos that you're going to teach the students are told that week so we are doing elbow this week range of motion mmt palpation please go to your lab handout handout before class preview and look at all the techniques first okay so that's exposure number one now i want you to self-practice or imagine it right this is how athletes learn skills we think about the skill that we're trying to learn and we do it over and over again in our minds so I'm I'm inviting you to consider that in this mode that we are in this is probably not a bad way to help the students begin to develop the actual motor skill set so view the videos mental imagery and self practice please palpate all the bony and soft tissue structures in the elbow before we meet online to talk about them, to talk about range of motion, MMT, and watch the videos together, okay? So I think this is very important here. Watch, try, 
And now the third exposure. You are in class together. You open up your lab, you share screen, and you say, guys, we're gonna march through palpation, and I'm gonna talk about common scenarios why this would be useful to palpate. The rotator cuff muscles, the delts, right? The subscap. And then I'm gonna show you videos of range of motion. I want you to, I know you've already watched it once, you've tried it once, let's discuss what kind of patient would this be relevant for, right? How, describe for me how, what position this was done in. Talk about the, the uh, movement, movement arm, the landmarks for the moving arm, the stationary arm, and the axis of rotation, right? All of this is now interactive conversation instead of here we go it's five hours we're just going to show you techniques it doesn't have to be like that the students have already laid a foundation for you to build on i think that there is a better way to do this online motor skill training and part of it is graded exposure the other piece that i want to mention is this idea of virtual checkoffs there's two reasons why i think virtual checkoffs is important one, the students feel very isolated. So they miss that one-on-one -on -one contact that they're getting when the TAs come around and give them feedback, when the faculty come around and give them feedback. Now, granted, I don't think faculty, maybe a faculty team can handle a group of 50 students, but in general, how we've been doing it is we've used third-year students, the third-year TAs. So these are all hand-picked, very good students who have 15 minute segments every week with a group of students. So one student will come in and do their virtual checkoff. So we have a checkoff list. And we use the checkoff to mimic how they are going to be tested during the final practical. Because I think it is very anxiety driven. There's a lot of anxiety in this unknown. So you really want to create an environment where they are getting a little bit of one-on-one -on -one feedback they're getting a feel of what it's like to perform skills on the camera, and you are actually prepping them for success when they get to the online virtual, virtual exams. I mean, if you think carefully about the reality of whether we are really going to be back in class in fall, I hope we are, that's usually when I teach, but fall, as they say, is flu season. There is a pretty darn good chance that we are going to be kicked out of the university again because because of you know the pandemic spiking you know the infection spiking so we really have to think through a process that is reliable a process that is fair to the students and i think that can get them to successfully learn these, these skill sets here's an here's how we tested this just about three weeks ago i want to give you a glimpse of how we did that now first I want to say that I believe virtual checkoffs is really graded exposure. It's week by week familiarity with the process of how we are going to do the online testing. So every week the TAs would say, hey, show me these four techniques, a palpation, a range of motion, an MMT, and a neuro part of the neuro screen. Please demonstrate it to me. So the students would get used to this idea that, oh, okay, I better be ready. I need to be practicing. Someone's going to give me feedback, so it's low stakes. Imagine they've done that eight times, 10 times, before they finally got to the practical exam. How valuable is that graded exposure in helping them get into a rhythm? I think that's the other part that the students have talked to us about. It feels like we're out of rhythm. There's no weekends and weekdays. There's no lunchtime where I eat with my classmates and then we study. So it's hard for them to feel a, a process. This is part of how I envision online testing and preparation for online testing. Some mechanism to prepare them week by week for virtual online checkoffs that will eventually become a very similar experience when they do their online testing. So this is a short glimpse into how we did it. So each of us, faculty members, there was five of us, each of us had a different range of motion MMT palpation question list. So I'm gonna take us back to the beginning of the sheet. So here's test number nine. 
So we told the students, okay, you're coming in at eight o'clock. We created a waiting room. The students would come into the waiting room. We would admit them at the right time and we would give them the four techniques. Please show me infraspinatus, manual muscle test, measure hip flexion, test the dermatome of C6 and palpate the capitate. They would give it, be given a moment to write these things down and then they would borrow their mom, their roommate, their spouse. They would be on a couch, on a coffee table, whatever the case it might be, and they would go through and perform the techniques. Our students felt very comfortable doing that. In fact, the, the demonstration of the skills was quite impressive. I think part of it is because it is consistent with the way we taught them week by week. There's nothing new there. There's no anxiety. They just need to know their stuff. They're going to be tested the same way they've been checked off every week. Something to be said about that. The other thing that I would say is Chris, who put together this list for us, made it such that our ability to grade in a very uniform way was guaranteed. So the, the image, the no, normal expected ranges. And so we each had a few questions that we could stagger, we could randomly use to minimize the chances that the students are texting and sharing what kind of techniques that we're asking about. All right, here's the other thing. I have made available to you a fundamental skills grade sheet. So this is our grade sheet for this class and you can see that as I'm grading, the score is adding up for you. And then you can see here that there is now con uh, that comments that we can use. All of this is hiding in a Dropbox that our teaching assistant has help helped us to set up. Okay. So the funny thing is sometimes the students may not have someone available to do their testing on. And so we are now open to interspecies testing here. I'm just kidding. We will do whatever it takes, but actually we expected the students to have a live human, but we just thought it was funny that, you know, this is getting a little bit crazy. How are we going to do all of this online testing? Some students don't have roommates. You know, what happened was we, we said, hey, you know what, for testing, you need to have, have someone that you can do these techniques on. You'll have to figure out the best way for you to do it. Luckily, the bulk of our students either had roommates, spouses, brothers, sisters, someone to do it. And in the worst case, as you could see, they have always have pets. So I think well, you can, they can be uh, doing it for animal rehab. It's animal I mean, rehab, really, exactly. You're, you're, ahead, you're ahead in the game here. We are preparing them for flexibility in a very tough marketplace of the future. Canine rehab. Canine rehab, exactly. Anyways, you know, in these crazy times, it's nice to have a laugh. I think it's fun to have the students, um, ah, you know, I think it's, it's okay to let things not be so serious. I mean, but when it comes to testing, we still need to hold, hold, hold the line. We need them to be able to do things the right way. Here's the gate app. So let me tell you a little bit of background about the gate app. So maybe about four years ago, I said to Chris Patterson, who, who's finishing his PhD right now in human movement, um, I said, Chris, so what are some of the challenges of teaching about human movement? Well, we always look at static pictures, right? And um, we always look at bar graphs and the bar graphs mean nothing when they're not associated with images. I said, exactly. And by the way, I spend tons of time looking for crummy videos on YouTube trying to make like this is, a, this is how we educate them. So I said, Chris, why don't we think this through and create an app that will help the students learn human movement in a more organized way. And secretly, in the back of my mind, I've been thinking about for a movement-based profession, how is it that we teach movement? How do we help students see visually how people move, what areas move first, at what rate do these different joints move? What muscles are functioning at these different periods of time? How do we tell that story? And so I will show you where we're headed. But the gate app was really just my beta, beta platform. It was my test platform 
to figure out, could we teach human movement? And now could we teach all the other variations of human movement, uh, uh, functional, functional activities using the same platform? So here we have di divvied out the gate app. And I, this is part of the fundamental skills because this is typically in the early first year of PT school, uh, of all, most of the, the different programs. So here we've decided in the learn phase that everything would have an image because that was one of the complaints. We talk about the phase. We talk about the range of motion requirements for that phase, except the graphs are always separate from the videos. The graphs have no meaning until you have the image to cross-reference to. So here at initial contact, the hip's at 20 degrees flexion. The knee is at five degrees of flexion. It's at zero degrees of dorsiflexion. The EMG used to be just isolated bar graphs. I remember James, you and I used to talk about this. The moment we started talking about muscle activity, the student's eyes would roll up in their head because it didn't make sense. There's too many disconnects. But now when you see, hey, the foot is about to slap on the ground, that's why the anterior tib is firing. That changes the way students can understand movement and muscle activity. And here are the critical events. So you can see we tried very hard to make sure that the language was compatible, which with whichever style of, you know, the critical events are the same, how we label it sometimes are very different. And so we tried our best to make it universal. So you can just click through the different phases and the students could now flip tab to tab. This is how I envision students learning about movement. This is how I envision teaching movement. When they're done, so the students would usually go through and explore this and learn this in a very kind of predictable, learn at your own pace, study the image. Does the muscle activity make sense or not? Does the range of motion make sense based on the image? So they're beginning, they're, they're trying their best to kind of learn the basics before we go to analyze. Analyze is now how we get them to translate this into clinical practice. So you have regular speed, you have close up slow motion, you have different views, and as captured in our motion lab, you have range of motion real time. So think about how fun this can be. You stop the video at any point and you ask them, what phase is this? What range of motion is occurring at the hip, the knee, and the ankle? And you can just play this interactively with them. Same thing for EMG. Here's the anterior tib. The ankle is in swing. The, the leg is in swing. Now that the foot's on the gr ground, the anterior tib is quiet. So the stories that you can tell, the interactions that you can create, I think this is how you make understanding movement real. Here are your deviations. So for example, this patient always complains of knee stiffness and knee pain. So when we looked at her from the front view, we noted that she has a varus thrust. How are you going to describe a varus thrust? There's no better way than to talk about someone who has medial joint line enlargement, stiffness and pain, and is demonstrating the movement fault. Here is the patient with insufficient knee extension. Right? What's the associated phase? What are some potential causes? Why did we put the causes? Because we thought that this would be a fantastic way to build a bridge to, hey, by the way, in your manual muscle tests, what, how would you test this? Hey, by the way, for your range of motion, how would you test this? What's the stationary arm? What's the axis? What's the movement arm? What are the landmarks? How would you treat this? Even if they don't know anything yet about treatment, you haven't gone to ortho yet, allow them to expand their thinking with whatever previously known knowledge that they have. This type of conversation is how you create deep learning. This is why we put this here, so that the, the faculty could help them 
go beyond the curriculum, go beyond that semester and say, think about what are some common ways you've seen in the clinic before that you would work on quadriceps weakness? Oh, right, electrical stimulation. That's what you guys are learning right now in your, in your physical agents class, right? So I think a lot of this is already built for you so that you can now really work the magic with the teaching, with the transference of your clinical expertise into these because you don't have to spend so much time building this. You can now really craft their reasoning and their thinking. So you can see that we have both analyze for deviations of prosthetic gait. Here is your transfemoral. Here is knee instability. He is actually a professor. So when we film this, he just pulled the battery out of his knee. So it can go from your strictly orthopedic and partly neurologic, different, ver uh, different types of right, uh, gait deviations, and it can also cover some of your gait analysis for your prosthetic, prosthetic gait problems. Okay, so I would add in one more piece. We purposely turned these into case studies since these were real patients. So the patient that's complaining of significant great toe pain and heel pain, Okay, he is one of our athletes. We have created the case for your students so that they could go into their Zoom breakout rooms, read the case, look at the aggravating factors. Now these are fairly basic cases, but we thought that this would be a fantastic way to make them feel like clinicians. So this is the patient coming in. This is their aggravating and easing factors. They may not know too much about that yet, but they'll be able to understand enough and they will start going through the clinical reasoning questions. Now, all the answers are here. We've hidden it on purpose. We tell them, don't look at the answers. We want you to go into your groups and discuss the patient. And when we come back out, we will now discuss what we see together. And so here for you as faculty, you'll be able to quickly look through and actually add to, but at least you have the foundational answers to build from. So you can see that the students can then go through and do their analysis. And begin to talk about tissue structures, tissue stresses, deviations that they see. So we have cases that are neuro patients. We have cases that are prosthetic gait deviations. We have neuro patients. This is a complete spinal cord, incomplete C5 spinal cord injury. All of these cases are here for you to discuss with the students. Um, any questions so far? Dr. Well, we got a, a, a short list of questions here. Um, Jocelyn H asked about posture. Do you address, is there a posture component in any of the FIGIU apps? They have it with their anatomy class. Uh, so I don't uh, know if there's any, any th way to address that. Actually, I don't have that. You know what? I'm going to be working on that. That is something very easy to do. Um, and we, we recently went back to the university and brought our green screen, uh, brought the green screen home. So those are things that I, I, in fact, would you, Josh, would you uh, email me at mike at physiou.com so we could talk about that? I'd be very interested to hear. It's Jocelyn and Jocelyn. Dana, and, Jace, and Dana just jumped on and said it'd be great. So Dana, yes. thanks for speaking up because now you're on the team to help out. Exactly. You know, I'm thinking maybe you have images of the common different postural deviations, postural faults. And then you have a smattering of pictures and images, front, side, and rear view, maybe front view as well, that students can now go and analyze. Yeah. So what something like that. Weak? What muscles are weak? What muscles are tight causing it? I mean, exactly. We, we can ble bleed this into rather just memorizing postural phenomena. It's like what causes it and how do you then treat it? You know, just all goes to that permanent learning rather than just learn and burn for a test type right. thing. Right. Second question, tester sheets, if you can share where like yeah. you uh, 
The tester sheet is here. Remember physiou.com, educator, free resources. And then here under teaching content, you have fundamental skills grade sheet. And so it is here for you to just replicate and use or modify. But uh, I thought that this would be useful to share because you know what we do is we create folders. So we know from tester five, which was me, I would have these, 15, these 10 students. And so each of these sheets were replicated with their names already put on it. So I would just click into my Google Drive, pull out a sheet, grade it, and it was already done. So that later we could easily add the grades and, and go over this. We could find it easily and so that's where it's at. So all some of you have already found it. The other two questions, you may get to them later. You already addressed one, but uh, Michelle K is asking for uh, kind of a kind of a uh, kind of a reiterate the online testing uh, methods and how you've done that. And the other one is the individual apps that are still out there on the iOS app store or something uh, where you can buy individually the MMT ROM yeah. versus, you know, like now you've gone to the web base and, and, and the, and the uh, value that. Yeah. That so I think you may do that at the end, but I just want to. Well, I think this is a good moment just to say when we started, we had one app. It took us two years to build one app and that was the orthopedic low back pain app. Eventually, we kept releasing apps into the App Store, but it became impossible for us to keep updating them because you have to you have to go through a very laborious updating process. One typo, you have to go through the entire submission, approval, disapproval process with Apple, with Google Play. And eventually, the students said, hey, our phones are full. We cannot handle any more apps. So we decided to move into this web-based platform because all of our videos are short. So streaming would no longer be a major issue. I would advise that nobody uses the native iOS Android apps. You only use the web app because you will keep getting new apps and new additions. So this is the future. This is where I think you never have to buy a new edition of PhysioU. You just continue to support us continuing to update it do research, to, to make new apps. Um, and so uh, I would say don't use the ones that are on the iOS store or, and, or Google Play anymore. This is the future. The only reason we've left those up, up there for now is because we don't have necessarily the ability to l allow people to just buy, like I only want your range of motion MMT app, right? Right now we can't do that very well and for that matter, the apps are so cheap. Uh, I'll share that with you uh, towards the end. The apps are so cheap because we know that the student's debt burden is very high. And so again, I would say that the web-based version is probably the most flexible version. The students can use it on their iPad, their Google Pixel phone, their PC, their Mac, anywhere they have a browser, they can use it. The students really needed that flexibility. Okay, so let me take us through. Uh, that's the Gate app. I am excited because today we will be releasing the Physical Agents app. There is iterations, there's still updates. I still have faculty vetting it, going through it, and sending me feedback. But I will be making those changes on the fly. The fac many faculty have reached out and said, hey, we're in the midst of our Physical Agents class. We need this app. So let me take you there. This is in our development platform. So here at the bottom is the new Physical Agents app. So now you can pick and choose. So let me slow down here. I know I'm scrolling too fast. So you've got all your major categories. And within those categories, you have the different devices. Okay. So I'm going to take us to something I think might be a little bit more useful or cooler, not necessarily useful. So here's here is your diathermy. So I can hear the collective groan of having to set up the diathermy machine to remember how to start it and, and, and use it. I remember having to do this every year. It was painful, even though I kind of dig diathermy, to be honest. So I, uh, there, <laughs> to be honest, it is in a bunch, it, it's in the clinical practice guidelines for certain problems. So here's your diathermy. 
here is the information broken down into little pieces purpose indications your references here is a video of the setup narrated by me the use of shortwave diathermy can be applied to the patient here we are using capacitive plates the plates should be parallel and facing one another with the target region in between the plates so you can listen to the whole two minute spiel or many faculty will just want to talk about it so we've turned this into a high speed silent video so you can say guys we want to make sure that the towel is there to absorb any moisture we want to make sure that the plates are parallel now as we go ahead and set up the device we always have an image gallery that also allows you to just flip through the different parts of the setup because we figured students will want to watch it in different forms at different times in clinic they may just want to go hey you know what I have a patient waiting for me I need to do I need to do lumbar traction so here is my purpose here is my gallery and I just need to quickly flip through this how do I set it up All right so all the key tips are here under setup you'll see that we have the settings Okay, contraindications and precautions are all here as well. And we think of this also at, I mean, healthcare literacy, right? Helping the patient understand what's going on is so important. And so this is a patient education piece that the students will all read because they need to be able to verbalize in their own language. This is why we're doing it. This is what it should feel like. Here are some things that you sh when you should avoid this type of treatment and talk to your therapist before using if you have these different things. The students will eventually just email this to their patient. Okay? Because if you think about so here you can just email this to the patient. They don't need a subscription. They can just read that. The other thing that I would say is for example, let's take ice massage so here's cryotherapy, here's ice massage. Patient education, I would like for the patient to know why it's there, what it should feel like, and how are you going to do this at home? Right? How often should I do this? So it becomes your automatic instruction sheet that will help your students become more effective in the clinic. We also set up case studies specifically because we thought there's no better way to really deepen the learning than to create a case where the students could read about the tennis elbow case, talk about in their breakout rooms what modality they may choose to use, talk about the contraindications and precautions, what is the ideal setup for the patient, right? And so all of these different cases are now available for you to utilize and discuss. So there's always a body chart and then the case study. Okay, so that is the Physical Agents app. You can look out for it today. Sometime later today, the programmers are going to turn it on and then it will be available in your, let me see. Yep, it, it's not live yet. So I sent out the, the command this morning and the team will get to it sometime soon. So it's going to show up right here for you. Do you did you show how they do the virtual like they actually move the the sound head and stuff out there? Question yeah. Is, so how do you, how do you test for physical agent skills virtually? Right. So here is something that we've been working on as well. These are the simulations that we've created. So I'm going to take you through one of them because I think they're just so so cool. Okay. So your students have just learned ionophoresis or electrotherapy this week when they go home, they will have a chance to play through these simulations. I think of this as another way to hit their brain with the information, just in a different environment. So part of it is information delivery, and part of it is video, and part of it is interactions, right? So it's kind of watch, play, think, all of these things that we wish we could do, PhysioU is doing it for you. So. 
This is what they'll this is they'll click on their ionophoresis simulation and they'll get to see all the information that they learned, but in a slightly different way. Here's the setup. The contraindications and precautions. Let's move in to the device. Right? So if I hover over the device, I get to explore the device and what the different devices, the different buttons do. How cool is that, right? Because for our students, now we have, we, we're hoping that they get to each device and they get to see it, but they only get to see it once. Imagine they get to play this over and over again at home, okay? I hope that my students will be able to picture every device. What does that dashboard look like? What are the buttons for? So if you click to proceed, there are slight minor interactions like, okay, let's set this ionophoresis up on your carpal tunnel patient. What are What is the correct order of steps you should take? Well, I should probably check and clean the patient's skin. Great. I should place the electrodes on the patient. That's third. I should place the medication on the active electrode and I should adjust the intensity to the desired effect. We are going through all of these simulations. In fact, uh, uh, several professors are, go are going through these simulations to, to make sure that everything is vetted and working properly. So these take a lot of work, as you can tell. So if your setup for carpal tunnel patient is 10 minutes, what would the amplitude have to be? Right, 40 milliamp minutes. If your patient can only tolerate, so something's not right, the patient says, I can't tolerate that. They can only tolerate one mil minute, uh, one milliamp, right? How much time will that, will it take for, what's the dosage? Well, that will probably take 40 minutes, right, at one milliamp. And then here, you can click on the pads, you can click on the medications, the common medications. And then we'll give you a little case. The patient says, I have a lot of pain, but I don't have any redness or swelling. So what should I do to manage pain? The medication uh, that the physician will most likely have prescribed, something to reduce pain instead of reducing inflammation. Can you mix the polarities of the medications in order to treat swelling and pain? Well, no, because they may have different polarities, right? So all these little clinical reasoning questions that we want them to kind of think through. Clean the skin in preparation for the electrodes. Ensure that there is no metal in the area to be treated. Using a syringe, inject the appropriate amount of medication into the pad. So they will watch the video again that you've probably had them watch already in, their, in, in the early part of their class. And then we take them in to do a case. Okay, so we have, we're, we're finishing these, all of this text here. But you can see that the patient's coming in with severe tennis elbow. Why don't you choose the contraindications that might apply? So they go through and they choose the contraindications. So again, think about how much graded exposure in my mind is a very big piece of how we help students attain mastery. Is It's not a one and done. It is always multiple ways to hit their brain in different directions so that they can really utilize the content and, and make some decisions with it. So my what- question, My yeah. question was how did you get to this sim? This sim is hiding in our development platform. We are building it as we speak. Uh, the team announced that besides traction, we have finished all the simulations and this will be available for the students, I'm hoping sometime in July. But I mean, we, we worked on the app first so you would have a reference tool. This is the next generation of how I think about teaching modalities is these simulations. And so it, when you when you roll these out, I mean, you're going to well announce it too. Yeah, the faculty everybody. will all know. We will teach you how to find it, how to utilize it. It just takes an enormous amount of work, if you, as you can imagine. So PhysioU is no longer just a video library. 
I hope that you are seeing that we are thinking deeply about evolving the way that we teach our craft. We teach the skill sets and the thinking. There are many projects that uh, I will share with the faculty over time as they evolve and become more real. Um, but this is this is really this is real. I have them for all the modalities. They will play through these. Um, uh, I see it as they play these every weekend after they're done learning this particular uh, particular modality. Two other quick kind of ten thousand foot questions, and one is uh, with the uh, scenarios, case studies, whatever where you have the answers, um, how do you blind, I know the answer, but I'll ask you rhetorically for the group. Yeah. Uh, do you blind the answers from the students? And then the second thing is that, is there a way to, and Jocelyn's funny, she, um, she trusts them, but she wants verification. Is there any way to track whether the student actually spent time going over and looking at the videos? So not in the current model. So the, we are rebuilding the entire, the entire system I have not even thought much about tracking at this point, even though we can track overall users clicking here and there. We just didn't think that faculty, like we, I haven't even imagined what a faculty dashboard for each individual program would look like. It, it's a very complicated issue. If you think about it, you will have students using PhysioU apps from first year, second year, third year, and even into the first year in clinic. So to be able to keep track of them is, is not an easy task, but it's definitely something that people have asked for. It's something I'm thinking about. Um, yes, you're right. Students may or may not choose to leverage this resource. I think it is kind of cool enough and way better than staring at pictures of modalities that they will no doubt go here to learn. And so, the tracking thing is um, something that's in my mind. It currently doesn't exist. And then um, um, they, um, it goes back to the student's responsibility for their learning. I think we've gotten to a different group of, of learning mindset for our students that you know they're responsible for the learning. So if they uh, go over a scenario and they click right to the answer rather than try to problem solve to the answer themselves first, they lose the benefit of the of the app, right? You know, and, and such. So, and I think, uh, and then also, Johnson, I think that if um if they don't review the videos, and then when you get to the real time discussions or, or breakout rooms, or whatever, uh, they're gonna sound like 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 knuckleheads. They're not gonna. Know yeah, they they won't know the about. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So and so, I mean, it's almost kind of a peer pressure. To say, man, I don't want to look like a like a dummy in front of my colleagues. They better take a look at this video and have an idea of what we're doing today. Right. So yeah, we'll see. So here you're adjusting the setting. So we've asked the student, the parameters is the time is 20 minutes. You set the, the time 20 minutes. What is the dosage? What is the current? Please drag your hand and set the appropriate dosage. How cool is that, right? Why did I do this? Because I think this is the exact thing that we don't have the ability to help them do. So we are creating animations for them that will help them move the ultrasound over the shoulder, collect, connect the pro appropriate leads in a cross pattern for the IONO for, or for the for the IFC, right? Play with the dashboard to learn how to use the device. All of this we are building for you and for the students. So um, let me. I know we are running close to the end of time, but or to the end of our our time together, but. Let me take you back. I'll finish up this presentation here. I hope you guys are, are seeing uh, this to be valuable. Um, okay. Is there any comment on the uh, learning um, management systems? Yes, the, from the learning management perspective, system perspective, you might consider um, that any of these videos, you can embed into your LMS, that's not an issue. The students will click on it and then it will take them to, to the website. So we are working on a way to make it easy for the students to just log into the LMS and then boom, Physio is there for them. But that is going to be in version two. The programmers are in the redesign process. We aren't even able to see the blueprints of the redesign until probably late July. Okay, just this is probably the last main app that I'll be talking about. This is the fundamental, 
you know, clinical skills of assistive device fitting. So the students can watch videos of how to fit these devices. They can learn about all the gate patterns. So here is your different gate patterns with all your different assistive devices. You can watch it together. They have watched it ahead of time. They may use umbrellas to try these different things out, right, at home. And these videos were designed for both right and left lower extremity. You can see that we filmed with a stocking on each because we wanted to make sure that you could eventually show the patient how to use their crutches, watch the video together. For modified three-point gait, with the left leg affected, have the patient first bring the crutches forward, next the left leg, and finally step through with the right leg. This can be emailed to the patients, just like instructions on how to go up and down stairs. Left extremity, non-weight bearing. We'll watch this together with the students. They will try it out themselves, and then they will know to watch these videos with their patients and then email the video to their patients. This app includes bed mobility, Okay. We filmed the very basic, most basic version so that you could augment it with whatever you wanted. All the extra stuff you wanted to, to tell them, you could build on this basic thing. Okay, so all these videos are here for you. Sit to stand and stand to sit with the different devices. Basic transfer training right lower extremity, non-weight bearing. The following is how you would perform a stand pivot transfer. You will first begin by having the wheelchair as close to the strong leg as possible. And then you're gonna have your patient scoot towards the edge of the mat and then lean forward as they stand up on the strong leg. And then you'll have them pivot towards the chair, assisting them as necessary. Reach back for the handle, lean forward as you slowly lower yourself down into the chair. And then we also have some wheelchair, basic wheelchair, the idea, the purpose, some factors to consider, how to fit them, some basic propulsion and mobility, right? So how to get up and down ramps through the doorway. So this can be something that you use to teach the students. The students will teach the patients and they will email it to the patients. Uh, in fact, I'm now working with another professor out of Plymouth, uh, Barb, who said, hey, I would like to add some amazing stuff about like pressure relief. So this week I filmed a bunch of pressure relief videos. Again, this app will continue to evolve based on feedback and support from you as faculty. All right, so a sneak peek. So this is probably the last two things that I'm going to show you today. As part of your gait analysis, partnering with Dr. Edie Kendall and also Dr. Brian Cleveley from University of Idaho, we have a gait, virtual gait analysis app that the students can now use to begin the process of systematic gait, right, gait analysis. So you can slow the gait speed down, you can apply goniometers on the patient, and we are using the Edinburgh Visual Gait Score. The students will basically go through, analyze what they see, and click on what they find. So as they go through this systematic process, at the end they'll be able to compare their score to one another, as well as compare to a key that Dr. Kendall is putting together. So you have a number of different patients in here that they can then go ahead and analyze. The next version of this I will put in the Rancho, uh, basically all the key faults, I'm going to organize it in this same fashion. So you can choose to use the Edinburgh Visual Gate Score or kind of the Rancho style analysis. And we ask them systematically, joint by joint, what do they see? Because I think this is how we train students to become movement analyzers. All right, so this I hope to be out by the end of June or early July. So we have already beta tested this with some of our faculty and we are now adjusting it and making it better. This is the last thing I was going to show you. This is my vision for how we will teach movement for the future. 
It is why I built the Gate app. So Dr. Chris Patterson, myself, and Dr. Chris Sabelski out of St. Louis uh, University, we have been working together. Chris has been gathering data. Chris Sabelski, myself, and Chris Patterson, we sit in a room and analyze movement data and try to create a language in which we can talk about movement. So let me give you a glimpse of what that looks like. So you click on the Functional Movement app. It opens the app for you. And now you get to choose the common functional movements that you want to learn about. We think that, again, movement needs to be taught in static images with information that the students can process over time, and then eventually videos, the analyze phase. So it will directly mimic the gate app. And we are taking, instead of calling things necessarily normal, we've, we've talked a lot about this because we really don't know what normal is. There's variations of movement that increase or decrease the risk on certain types of tissues. That's probably the bottom line. There's riskier movements for certain types of tissues versus other movements. So let's go in and take a look. Here's the learn phase. Here is learning with static images about the phases. So here we are describing the phase as they move from initiation to execution to termination. So we are going to keep these movements relatively simple. And then you can move into range of motion requirements. So here is the range of motion requirements that are occurring at each phase of movement. Looks familiar, right? Looks like gait. But I think the story that you're going to end up telling is the rate of movement at the hip is way higher than the weight rate of movement at the lumbar spine. And that's a good thing. A joint that is built like a hinge is way better to flex more at than something that is built with discs and ligaments that you don't necessarily want to stress as much. Okay, so. Here's muscle activity. So again, we have EMG activity. This is what's happening at the erector spinae, the glute max, and the biceps femoris at each phase. Again, it's a, it's a story about tissue stress, tissue usage. And eventually, here are the critical events. So this is what Chris, Chris and Chris and I sit there thinking about what are the critical events that are occurring at each phase so that we can help students learn them and eventually visually analyze it. Now when you go to analyze, you can watch different views. You can see the gate app right here. This is really why I built the gate app. You can see different, right, different views here. And eventually, you will get to watch the video of their movement and the range of motion that's occurring in real time. Imagine the stories that you can tell about human movement now that you will have this tool available for you. And then here is EMG. So you can see at the early phases of the movement, the erector spinae don't have much work to do. But as the trunk becomes more ver horizontal, now you really see the hips, the biceps, everything's kicking in. And then they have to slow the movement down. So, in closing, I, I hope that's just a glimpse of what we've been building. Michael, What's that? I don't know if you got muted or bandwidth-wise. Oh, but did you see all of that? Can you hear me, James? Can you hear me, James? I, could, I can hear you, Michael. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. So... I guess in closing, and I, I'm sorry we've gone over time, I just had so many things that I want to show you. Right now, you have several of these apps that are available to augment your classroom. 
assisted devices, range of motion MMT palpation. Uh, this is transfers as well, wheelchair. You have your, your clinical, uh, your physical agents that will come out today. And then you have your gait app. This virtual, virtual reality pediatric gait analysis app will be out by late summer, probably like July. And this functional movement app, we are hoping to present about the data at CSM. And in the meantime, we are continuing to crunch the data and build the content so that eventually you will have an app that you can use to teach all the common functional movements. And I hope that will be the building bridge, that will be the building blocks for how we create movement specialists, how they will be able to see and understand variations of movement and the risks of tissue, risk to tissues based on different movement patterns. I think that is actually where we will become the experts because of our expertise in understanding movement in that way. So uh, I think that is uh, the last thing I guess I would say is remember that I am always excited to hear your feedback. We are making changes to the apps all the time and also ideas that you might have as you are in, interested in developing content with PhysioU. My vision is to create the ultimate resource for faculty and students to enhance student learning so that many may be cared for better. And so uh, this is an open invitation to those of you who have already created things, are interested in creating things, and have a vision for what you think PT education needs. And this is open actually to all of my OT, coll OT colleagues and athletic training colleagues as well. We have we believe that many of our tools can be utilized to enhance education. Um, and then we will sp specifically create apps for the different, different groups based on the need. So um, ultimately, I would just say that remember that your students, you don't even have to worry about asking them to buy anything. Because of COVID-19, we have extended free access to all faculty and students. Now, faculty will always have free access. You can utilize this in your classroom, whether your students buy it or not. But there is free access for all of your students through August 15. We're hoping to be back in the classroom by then. And this will give you a good chance to see, is this something that would you would find useful for your, for your program? If you need access for your students, you need to go to physioucom slash coronavirus. There is a form that will have you fill out. Only one of you needs to fill this out so that we will know how many codes to send you. So here is applying for the codes, what program you are from, and here is the number of codes that I need. And we will send codes to you so that your students can utilize this free to try out. And if your faculty need access, please email us separately at care at physioyou.com. You don't want to use the student codes. Faculty have full access because we believe that you can enhance your classroom even if you're just using it online or face-to-face. -face. Um, again, I, I, I think I'm just going to stop there and open it up for comments or questions. And make sure that you unmute yourself. James, are there any comments or questions? We got most of them done. Just um, uh, again, uh, Michelle K was asking uh, the online testing. If you can kind of review, yeah, again how you how you went through that. Yeah. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions too. Yeah. So for the online testing, let me take you back to that slide here. And then, what's the cost for students for fall of 2020? Okay, got it. Yeah. 108. Yes. Yeah. So let me do that first. Okay. Student pricing. You can do it either way, which is one, some schools will say, hey guys, we're gonna use this for all three years. So the best price you can get is $162 for four years. That's like $3.50 or something like that per month. So many schools will just say, this is great. I know it's important for them to have an extra year when they're first out in the clinic. We, in our program, we use it from the first day. In orientation, we share with them these apps they start using it the next day in gross anatomy and range of motion palpation. So they have the apps from the first day of class. The school, we work with schools 
to they can say I need 60 invoice 60 codes for four years and we invoice the school the students get the codes and it is built into a course fee so that the students can use their financial aid for it so that's one way to do it the other way to do it is just say hey I just want to try this out for a year so um, my, your students can actually just come here and pay $54 for the year starting August 16 they will have a full year to utilize it so $54 is like four dollars and fifty cents a month it's it I think I think that we've tried to make it very affordable for students to utilize so that's how you can get to this it's on our website and the students can come directly here and purchase it themselves or we can go through your bookstore and work with you in the department it's really up to you when it comes to the exam what I would say about the exam is what we we basically had a schedule students knew that at 8 o'clock Jim was coming in to the weight room in zoom at 8 15 Sarah was coming into the waiting room in zoom so we would admit them so we never had to worry about people popping into the exam while we were while we were running it we would admit them when it was their time they would basically meet us online at zoom so I would have Sarah at 8 15 and I would ask her Sarah show me the piece of paper that you have she would show me a blank sheet and then I would tell her okay I need you to show me MMT for infraspinatus range of motion for hip flexion I need you to test the dermatome of C6 and palpate the capitate we would give her two or three minutes to write these things down and to think through what she wanted to do then we would go to the grade sheet so I'm going to take you here and as she's performing the skills I am writing in here she is performing infraspinatus MMT and I'm grading her as she goes the total score is already being done here for you and then I'm writing comments like did not perform the technique on the appropriate species right she's doing it on her pet dog or patient didn't stabilize the trunk patient didn't do this that or the other so here are my comments and after that's all said and done all of these were already prepared ahead of the exam in folders so I essentially went to a greater five folder that was me in there I had test sheets these fundamental skills testing sheets I had one already made for each student their time and their name so I would click on it open it and grade and I would close it because Google will automatically save it there's no saving here so I would save it later we would go back in and we would add all the scores to the grade to the grade book this is how we will do our orthopedic exam as well so initially we will do a basic skills ortho exam but I think we have to think I'm thinking heavily about how are we going to create case scenarios that we can utilize not only in the online classroom but also for future testing we have built in the same way that we've built these simulations here in the same way that we built these simulations we have built 50 simulations for all of the common orthopedic conditions so you can see the team here has got all of paraffin, NMES, Ionto, TENS, ultrasound. But we also have a number of cervical radiculopathy. We're working on wound care right now. Elbow, wrist, and hand, total knee replacement. We have all kinds of, uh, all kinds of simulations that we're building, specific simulations for the PTA group eventually we may end up having to use simulations as a way to test students clinical reasoning physio U is exploring it and building it we're almost done but it again all of these are sensitive in the sense that it takes a lot of time to build and a lot of time to vet and so um, we, we, we kind of slow things down and make sure they're good before we push it out there any other comments or questions those grading sheets are available on the uh, education or educator thing. yep they are here right. under educator free free resources under teaching content 
and you have the fundamental skills grade sheet and you can uh, you can modify that to any you know you can just copy and paste and then and then create it for your ortho sheets as well for your ortho exam any exam neuro you just change the text so yep that's how you get to it I think that's all the questions all right fantastic guys sorry I ran a little bit late this video will be sent to you it is also available in our educator free resources um, uh, under the deep dive series and we will be running this over the summer to help you um, to, to be able to give you ideas on how to integrate this into your classroom so I'm free to um, hang out for a few minutes if anybody wants to chat if anybody has some thoughts but here's your deep dive webinar series and we will email this to you as well um, for all those who who attended this session so thank you so much, everybody, for staying this long. I hope this is useful for you, and um, look forward to being in touch, actually.